And joining us now on the debate, Peter Cormos, New Democrat MPP for the riding of Welland. Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And on the left, Jim Coyle, columnist at the Toronto Star. And Finn Poshman, vice president of research at the C.D. Howe Institute. Tonight, of course, is a Your Agenda Thursday, where we invite you to be part of the discussion so you can reach us by email at theagenda at tvo.org or on Twitter at twitter.com, and your hashtag is Your Agenda, or on our Facebook page, that's facebook.com slash The Agenda. And as always, our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog at tvo.org slash The Agenda. So visit the homepage, jump in, join the debate, and we'll put your comments up on the screen throughout the course of the program. Good to have everybody here tonight. Thanks for joining us for uh, a discussion that we've, I guess we've had, I alluded to this, Peter, earlier. We've had this debate, I guess, a bit in Ontario ever since uh, your party was in government, decided to build casinos 20 years ago. Since Mr. Ray uh, began that initiative. Indeed, yeah. it was. One of, his, one of his sadder legacies. Uh, okay, okay. Well, it, it's, it continues, eh? The love of Bob Ray by former New Democrats is still on. But he, he was a liberal then, he's a liberal now. <laughs> okay, I, Peter, I different shows, different, different show. Show. We're in different camps. <laughs> I understand. Uh, Ontario Lottery and Gaming is going to open up in 2012, uh, online gambling here. Uh, Quebec is going to do the same. BC's already got it. Uh, Jim, let's get you just to sort of lay out the arguments to start with. Why is the government of Ontario entertaining the idea of online gambling to begin with? Well, uh, gambling in uh, North America and uh, all of the Western culture probably has been mushrooming since maybe the 70s or the 80s. And it's not for nothing that two of the biggest expansions in Ontario, at least, have come when governments have been facing huge deficits. You know, when, when uh, Bob Ray opened the casinos uh, in the early 90s, uh, was the first big push, uh, you know, and uh, we had great sport torturing him with the lines he had uttered, the lines of utter purity and Scottish Presbyterianism and all the virtues, and uh, then his turnaround to, to introduce Casino in Windsor. And the same thing's happening now. The Liberals are in a, a terrible uh, situation. They've got a $20 billion deficit or thereabouts this year. And they're in a, a culture where uh, governments find it hard to be honest about taxation. They won't tax up front. You know? It's so anathema to the public that anything that looks like a way to tax uh, under the radar or uh, be said to be getting money from willing buyers, uh, it, and it's, all, it's, it's easy money, basically, for mm. governments. Uh, so, so that's the way to go. Uh, from my point of view, they're into a fairly dangerous territory now, I think, with online and things like the new poker lotto. Dangerous in what respect? Well, they're into the kind of convenience gambling and the unregulatable gambling that is, re is uh, uh, really dangerous for problem gamblers and uh, hard to control uh, youth involvement in okay. it as well. We're going to so, follow up on yeah. all this tonight. Yeah. Finn, I guess I want to bring you in at this point because uh, Jim's suggestion that governments generally speaking these days, haven't got the guts to raise taxes or think it's a bad idea in this economy, uh, and therefore they're looking for other ways to raise revenues. Does this seem like kind of low-hanging fruit in that case? It is low-hanging fruit. And uh, I, I need to declare something up front here is that uh, you know, I'm fairly strong in this position that it's uh, self-evidently wrong that uh, the government shouldn't be pursuing such low-hanging fruit. And uh, I'll also say I think this applies not just to gambling but to uh, sin tax more broadly. You know, think of uh, liquor, cigarettes, uh, all of that is governments chasing even revenue. And I think it's obviously wrong, self-evidently wrong, that governments, uh, for, as a point of public policy, for governments to pursue, pursue this because of the obvious harm. Now, so I need to Wait know... Wait a sec. They shouldn't tax sin? Is that what you're saying? Uh, they shouldn't tax sin more highly than any other activities are taxed. Not against the sin. There's no way you can get around that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have a strong libertarian view from that perspective. But these are clearly moralistic views, right? Or it's going to sound moralistic. So you better have your basis somewhere else. So as a matter of fiscal policy, as a matter of public policy, it clearly indicates the focus is wrong. Government fiscal policy is chasing revenue. It's chasing revenue. It's chasing even reven easy revenue. But what the government, you know, clearly should be doing is uh, is managing the spending better. So it's it's this message about focus there. Uh, there, there. There's more too. It actually encourages government to grow because uh, when 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 revenue is easy and and when you can bring out the revenue by drawing on the the ease with with which that revenue can be uh, can be got, uh, governments actually pursue more of it. So, so it if you look at liquor least. taxes, if you look at uh, uh, even, even green taxes that, that go after, uh, go after uh, like, the, like uh, gasoline taxes, uh, all of them, they tend to make governments grow. Not always and everywhere, but governments grow, they create programs. And uh, they create programs, they create constituencies, and that means governments are bigger than they uh, need to be okay. and get into more things than they need to do. Let me follow up with Peter on that. You heard Jim's uh, argument that when times get tough, 
and governments either can't or don't want to raise taxes. They look for other alternatives, and that's what your government did 20 years ago. Um, in some respects, this is just going back to the same playbook, is it not? Well, no, it's not. I think it's very different, even from the introduction of, of, of gaming casinos, which are a destination gambling place. Uh, and I, I would argue with you, this is very expensive revenue that we're getting from things like internet gambling or, or, or poker lotto uh, or, quite frankly, uh, taxation of cigarettes. I mean, governments take great joy in arguing that the tax on cigarettes is really all about protecting people from smoking. Yet, you and I both know that it's about the revenues that it generates. And there's that crazy conundrum in terms of governments uh, wanting to oppose or, 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 or suppress smoking, yet at the same time being addicted to, to the revenues from tobacco. Similarly with alcohol and spirits. Uh, you know, the government, the government doesn't justify its tax uh, on the basis of, of deterring people from drinking, uh, but somehow uh, they, they want to pretend that uh, there's a benign motive behind the tax. It's about generating revenue. I agree with you. Internet gambling, though, is a brave new world. There's a couple of observations. The government suggests that it'll, it'll, it'll make revenues of $100 million from Internet gambling. Compared to the debt deficit of, of $20 billion, this is peanuts. This is, this is modest. This is a sliver. Does every little bit help, though? But I said expensive revenue. You, you've got the government suggesting that it's going to somehow capture some of the internet gaming or gambling market. There's no guarantee of that. They're going to be competing with any number of, including offshore operators, that are going to undercut them every step of the way, whose games are going to be more colorful, bigger payoffs, uh, the whole nine yards. Finally, for the government to make its internet gambling site even modestly successful, it's going to have to engage in a huge advertising campaign that will generally get people involved in internet gambling who never would have thought of doing it before. Hmm. This is an insidious thing. I listened very carefully to, 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 to Mr. Isco. And Mr. Isco seems like the sort of poker player that I knew as a kid down on, uh, upstairs at Bill's Pool Hall when Dick Petkoff ran the games back in the 60s and 70s. Where would that be? Uh, Don Wellen. In Wellen, in Ontario. Wellen. Okay. Look, uh, those were poker players. Those were, were, were people who uh, on a Friday or Saturday night would play poker, five, six, seven, eight people. Uh, but it went home the next day. But even amongst them, I saw people with gambling problems. Hmm. Even amongst that level of playing, I saw people, yeah, who, who would borrow money from the bank, for instance. And don't, let's, let's not forget, we, we put warning signs on cigarettes, we put warning labels on, 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 on liquor. Uh, why at, at these gambling sites, there certainly isn't on lotto machines in, in, in the corner store, there should be a huge sign saying, just as there should be at the entryway on top of every slot machine in every casino, you are going to lose money. Mark our words. You're here to lose, <laughs> you think sucker. people know that already? No, they don't, they know, don't it. know it. They believe they're there to win. Look at the glossy advertising campaigns. Jim Coyle referred to the wacky uh, happy dance in one of his columns a, a month or so ago. Uh, you know, the, it, it's being marketed as fun, as entertainment. Dwight Duncan, when he announced it Finance gambling, he, Dwight, the finance minister, called internet gambling a new form of entertainment. Give me mm -hmm. a break. It's designed so that you can, you can gamble your brains out till 2 in the morning, go to bed, get up at 5.30 and sit there in your underwear from last night without even shaving or showering and start gambling again. Jordan Peterson, we needed a good uh, clinical psychologist in here today, mm -hmm. and that's why you're here. I want to read something that was in the St. John's uh, Telegram. Uh, this is many years ago, but it's very cute. Consider the Garden of Eden, they write, when it was just Adam, Eve, and the man upstairs. Come on, Eve says to her mate, have a bite. Chances are he'll never find out and the prize will be amazing. So Adam bites, a willing participant in the world's first recorded act of gambling. Creation mythologies from cultures across the globe all involve tales of risk-taking and fate-tempting, which suggests one unassailable fact. The human urge to gamble is profound, is universal, is primal. Do you think we're hardwired to gamble? We're hardwired to, to seek certain kinds of rewards. And our brains aren't that good at computing probabilities, especially when you get into the range of numbers that are really unimaginable. So your brain really doesn't automatically calculate the difference between a one in a hundred chance and a one in a million chance. Because we're not really wired biologically to respond properly emotionally to those kind of figures. And there's a difference between taking a chance and gambling. And let's leave poker out of it for the time being. You're not gambling with a slot machine. You're just losing. Well, you're it's, playing a game. You are playing a game. Yeah, but it's set up mathematically so that you have two, two ways. It's set up mathematically so that over the long run, you have no probability of winning. And secondarily, it's set up to maximize the probability that you'll become addicted. Because slot machines use a particular kind of what's called a reinforcement schedule. It's a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. And what it teaches people is to be insanely persistent. So if you want to teach animals 
to pull a lever so to the point where they starve to death, you use a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. And that's exactly what slot machines do. There's no excuse for it. Are they not fun? Fun, lots of things are fun. I mean, fun in itself is no mark of what's appropriate. There's also, uh, if you're a bully, bullying people is fun. Um, cheating on your wife can be fun. Internet porn is obviously fun. But Cocaine, for sure, is fun. But not advisable. Fun is not an indication that things are advisable. I mean, wouldn't that be lovely if everything <laughs> that was fun was advisable? Yeah, well, forget that. It'd be a great world, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, it's something world. to think about, but it certainly isn't the real world. I wonder whether our friend from the C.D. Howe here has a problem with... I mean, you've told us what some of your concerns are about this, but I wonder if it's the government in this business that is a, as big an issue for you. Is this something that really ought to be? I just saw there was an a email that just came in saying the government has no business being in the, in the wine selling business or in the gambling business. Well, it's crystal clear. Uh, it's, there are easy questions in life and hard ones. And, uh, is that an this, easy one? It's an easy one. And uh, the reason, of course, as I said, is that it, it, there, there's a big, big messaging problem. It's a really big messaging problem for, for the government itself and, uh, and for uh, its ultimate policy choices. There's a great easy example uh, of, um, from, from tax policy, oddly enough. As tax-free savings account, you wouldn't believe how, how it's like this. Uh, most people are encouraged to invest in RSPs, right? Everybody knows you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, and that's how we always used to be. However, it's wrong for some people. It's absolutely wrong. It's a wrong financial choice for some people who are going to lose because they make that choice. And it's just an odd thing about the tax, tax system. So if you had any doubts about whether the government should go this way, think about it as a matter of public policy. If something's ultimately going to be wrong for a significant set of the, of the population, you should really, really be careful before you go that way. And that's like this one. You, that's, this one is very similar. It creates a lot of harm. There is no question about it. No one will tell you that, uh, that it doesn't create harm. So okay, that but, raises the standard a lot. But Jim, there was a time, you and I are both old enough to remember there was a time in this province when to have an Irish sweepstakes ticket in your wallet was against the you law. You took the words right out of my mouth, Steve. Part of the story, I think, and part of the reason it's an easy message for the government is the huge cultural change in the last half century. Uh, the death of deference, you know, the fact that young people have been raised in a generation where they, you know, there, there's the mainstreaming of pornography, there's a, a reluctance to be told what to do, they want to speak their mind, they want to pursue their things. In my childhood, my dad used to come home from work, he was a streetcar driver, and even in our own living room, he would show us the ticket in his wallet because it was such a, a risque thing. Even the words vice and sin, they're so quaint, you know, people, uh, people don't think there are such things anymore, young people in any case. And in our house, there used to, and the, there was sort of the, uh, the, the, the weird trips to the liquor store, you know, when you filled out that little piece of paper and you handed it to a man who kind of looked at you. the booze was not shown. Looked shown. at you yeah. a little warily. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when the baby blue movies started coming on in the 70s, you know, there are things on, on primetime TV now that make that look like uh, Alice in Wonderland. Mm -hmm. Uh, young people, uh, you don't see people on the front lawns at Queen Park, Queen's Park complaining about this. You know, the reason, the reason Dwight Duncan, the finance minister, gave, it when, he, when he announced it, said people want it. And, uh, you know, and they seem to. They're, they're not, there's no big backlash. It's, it's one thing to say people want it. Jordan, do you have a problem with the fact that the government, by getting involved with it, seems to be giving it a kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval? Well, I, I have, I think, what's a deeper problem than that. Like, I don't really care that the government's involved in liquor and cigarettes. I mean, you could make a case against that and for that. Liquor and cigarettes were around before the government. But in Canada, gambling was not around before the government. I mean, the introduction of gambling as a problem into Canada has been completely created by the government. It basically started, well, it started with charities and bingos and horse racing. And then it really kicked in in about 1976 when the government decided to fund the Montreal Olympics in part through lottery tickets. Right. And ever since then, it's been an explosion. And so they have manufactured a, a fairly major social health issue out of nothing. And you can't say that about cigarettes or liquor. So I don't think there's any excuse for it all. And the fact that people are relying on, on it as a means of generating revenue, it's like, over what time period are you calculating the revenue? Peter, would you have less of a problem with this if it were saying, okay, private sector, you take care of this, but the government getting involved, I gotta draw the line there. The government getting involved worsens it because it adds some legitimacy to it. it it's, it's the public sector. But let's understand, Dalton McGinty jokingly said that his kids were the only people who lobbied him for mixed martial arts. 
but he certainly hasn't suggested that it was kids who that it was his kids who lobbied him for, for internet gambling or for, or for poker lotto, lotto. This is huge money, not necessarily the government cut, but the industry itself. There's obviously huge money be, be, being made now on perfecting programs. The technology and the understanding of the neuroscience about how people respond to the flashing lights and the action. Yeah, that's uh, and, going to get a lot better. And the technology is going to get better. Yeah, you, it's getting slicker sure. and slicker and slicker. Somebody sold these things to the government of Ontario. And the people who sold them to the government of Ontario, the people who are out to make the most amount of money, and that's the people who developed the software and are going to develop the next level of software as well. The, the, the problem with internet gambling, as well as with, with, with the type of slot machines that we're seeing, is that they are reinforced by, by the video games that kids are playing for the very earliest age. Well, the thing also about those electronic machines, eh, there's some very insidious things about those. Yeah. Because with a mechanical machine, there's a, certain, there's a certain honesty to a mechanical machine. But there's a real dishonesty to an electronic machine because those things can change yep. the ratios whenever they want. And an intelligent neuroscientist could figure out how to program those things so they're unbelievably addictive. In fact, the technology for that already exists. And it's also worth pointing out that um, there's a subset of vulnerable people, often elderly people, certainly people who have trouble with alcohol. Anybody who has trouble with impulsivity or cognitive control who is going to be, who's going to be put into real danger by the... Uh, continual widespread propagation of gambling. Are you going so far as to say the government is counting on those people to... They're encouraging it. it. They're look, encouraging and it's it. so hypocritical. Eh? I want to look at their ads. You know, there's the Ontario, I think, Ontario Gaming Commission. And then, you know, and, and, and the ads are in large letters. And underneath it says, please gamble yeah, responsibly. Right. And I think, well, first of all, gamble and responsibly are contradictions in terms. And I think it's, at least they should be honest about the fact that they're doing something corrupt. Instead of saying on the one hand, well, you know, come out and have fun, and, 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 and then saying on the other hand, well, we actually care about you. It's like, no, we don't care about you. The more money we can take from you, the better. And it's short-term and unimaginative. Peter. Steve, the casino doesn't make any profit from the person who shows up once a year with $10 in their pocket, mm -hmm. any more so than the liquor industry makes profit from the, from the type of family that maybe buys a bottle of whiskey and, and, and it lasts three years. That's not what it's all about. And nor does the cigarette industry make profit on the person who smokes one cigarette a week. Uh, and of course, the cigarette mm -hmm. industry will argue it's your choice. You don't have to smoke a pack or two packs a day. The gambling industry says, well, it's your choice. We've got Poker Lotto now, which is a seven day a week process with the video component at the, at the blue terminal in the corner store. And it's not marketed towards the high rollers. I've been in Pusateri's down on Yorkville Avenue. They don't have lottery machines in their little supermarket on, on Yorkville Avenue. So who's doing it? Well, the corner stores are, are, are selling these, and the, but the market is low-income people when you're coming to the $2, $2 number, numbers racket. Good grief. It's low-income people, and they're being suckered, and they're being, being, being taken uh, by, by a, by a, a, a premier by who, fan government. who fancies himself a, a, dapper, a dapper McGinty if you will, a, a card shark and, and, and a racketeer. We should say that uh, we obviously invited somebody from the government to be here tonight to defend them, their policy. Uh, they declined to make anybody available, as incidentally did the progressive conservatives. They declined to make anybody available as well. Uh, let's just take a time out here for a second because as we're having this conversation here in our studio, uh, Mike Miner is moderating a chat that's taking place online on our website, tvo.org slash the agenda. Mike, come on in here and tell us what folks are saying. Sure. Well, people are chatting here on our blogs and on Facebook. We actually had one woman ask us how long until she can watch the agenda while playing poker online. <laughs> uh, and generally, the chat has been leaning towards uh, the government being involved in uh, gambling. A lot of people have said this is just bringing the type of gambling that the government's already involved in up to date. We have someone named August who says he doesn't always trust that the government's working in his best interest, but he trusts the private interests less and he'd rather have this run by the lesser of two evils. Yemi Thomas on Twitter said that with the government, at least we make some of the money back. And for a lot of people, they've said that when you go online and you have to spend your money, they're kind of nervous going to these websites that are offshore. They don't know who they're giving their credit card information. They think that having the government, although it probably won't have the slick production and as much money into making it look good, that trust factor and that accountability, is, it would actually be appealing and they'd like to do their online uh, gambling with the government. Uh, another, other people are pointing out that if there is an uh, addiction problem with gambling, uh, a person named Redfern said, well, at least we'll have some money coming in from gambling to help pay for that problem. Okay, Mike, thanks very much. Keep monitoring and uh, we'll check back later with you tonight if we get a chance to. Uh, Jim Coyle, let me try this with you. Here's the setup. The government needs money. They got a 20 plus billion dollar annual deficit. They probably know that more than 90% of the people who do this, 
this gambling we're talking about, will do so without seriously damaging themselves, right? Without seriously damaging. Yeah. I don't know what the, it's probably, I'm guessing, 3 4% of the people who are addictive gamblers who need help. If you take A and B, do you really not do C because 3% of the people in the province won't be able to handle it? Uh, it's funny, David Foote, the demographer, uh, used to say that demographics explains two-thirds of everything. Right. And his view on this was that uh, the great wave of the baby boomers aging explained a lot of the traffic to casinos and the interest in, in gambling that took off in the 90s, in large part because it gave you a little buzz without uh, playing squash and blowing your knee out. You know, it was a little bit of excitement without physical risk as we were growing decrepit. Um, uh, so the casino culture is much different than, than what they're doing now. And young Ben, the uh, poker player, uh, sounded like a paragon of restraint to me. And the fact that he's played, been involved in that culture and hasn't run into anyone who's run into problems, it's also al almost mind-boggling. I've run into a fair number of people who've got into trouble, and gambling is addictive in the same way that substances are. It works the same neural pathways and triggers the same kind of reward system. And uh, you can spend a lot, of, a lot of years drinking your house away, and gambling can lose it for you in a real hurry. And mm -hmm. that's the trouble. You're getting people in uh, dire circumstances in a hurry. It leads to all kinds of family calamity and, and suicide. That's and one of the things that... There has been studies done on this on uh, the proportion of uh, gambling, and I think the last couple in Ontario have shown that uh, about a third of the gambling revenues come from a very small percentage of the players. Some of them may just be rich people who get a buzz out of blowing their money. Some of them may be people who can afford it, but there is a subset there of people who are essentially having their lives ruined. Okay, but Finn, as a matter of public policy, and that's what you guys study at the CD Howe, as a matter of public policy, do you deny 97% of the people of the province the right to do something? The government needs the money. They'll probably want to do it if only 3% of the people can't handle it. Well, that isn't really a public policy question in this, because no one's saying that uh, people should be denied the right to do so. In other words, pe uh, as a matter of public policy, you wouldn't necessarily say it's wrong for people to gamble or it's wrong for people to drink or it's uh, wrong for people to smoke, anything like that. It's, uh, as this is thinking about it from the point of view of a pure fiscal policy choice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in this sense, uh, this, this, this is a clear choice, right? So, uh, so, so be very careful in making the assumption that uh, if you don't think the government should be heavily involved in something, or really involved at all, uh, that it also means uh, we should prevent people in, in, in very many situations from doing so. It's, okay. it's simply they don't link up. Do you want to tackle that, Peter? If 97% of the people are okay with it and the government needs the money, do you want to deny this policy on the basis that 3% of the people can't handle it? Once again, very expensive money. In 2007, the net revenues of OLG was over $6 billion. I suspect it's higher now. Over six billion dollars. That means you have to multiply that by two or three. That means there was a twenty or twenty-five billion dollars spent or invested, uh, gambled by 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 Ontarians or visitors to Ontario. Uh, look, internet gambling. It's it's an open door for thirteen-year-old kids to be maxing out mommy or daddy's credit card while they're sitting in their bedroom. Well, uh, gambling. Surely there's going to be checks on kids doing this, aren't there? Well, in the well, same way there are checks on kids buying cigarettes or checks on no, kids no. buying booze. When you buy cigarettes, you're dealing with a real person. When, when, when you buy liquor, you're dealing with, with, with one of the great things about our liquor store in Ontario is that you're dealing with a, with, with a trained re well, retailer. Oh, pardon me, Peter, but that has nothing to do with whether it's the government engaged well, in, 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 the, well, in the activity or not. But you'll need entirely a credit card. Most 12-year-olds don't have credit cards, and you'll they, need they a credit card. They have mom card. or dad's credit card. There's they a whole do? Lot of, of course they do. What, what? Do you think, what do you think they buy the consumer products that they buy now? You, you, you talk about... Are you saying most 13-year-olds rip off mom and dad's credit card to go behind their back and go to go I'm not suggesting stuff? they necessarily rip them off, but a, kid, but, but a kid who's been tuned into the gambling world will. You talk about 3 to 4 percent, I argue that number is low. Number two, I argue that we're creating a generation of gamblers where the percentage is going to be much higher. Kids who have been conditioned on video games and, and, and tuned into the, into the Twitter world, into the anon anonymous world, uh, and entertainment fun. I, I, I've been to casinos. I've watched the compulsive slot players. They're not having a good time. Nobody's smiling. Nobody's laughing. They're focused. They're not interacting with other people. Uh, it, it is an eerie, strange, alienating world. Kind of a Pavlovian thing going it's on a, there? Well, yeah, very Pavlovian. Pavlovian. But, 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 but it's a very sad, depersonalized world. And I think a very, very dangerous one. And I say I predict that young people will become more tuned into that than their parents ever were. We are breeding and, and, and cultivating a generation of gamblers, and that's what that industry is all about. It's voracious. It has an, an unending, unending appetite and no morality. 
How about this? Uh, I just see the, uh, put that, can you put that up again, Michael? That was uh, interesting and I want to follow up on that. This via Twitter. The government may be able to cash in on the general distrust for internet gaming sites. The distrust is an impediment. So the government's removing another impediment. Why is that good? I don't see that as positive. I mean, it'll make more people gamble. Let, uh, people who are less impulsive will be more likely to gamble because they trust the source. Trust them to what? Not steal their credit card. They can't trust them trust to them. not take their money when they're gambling. No, but try, if, if you're concerned that the private sites are not regulated well enough or that they're too dangerous or they're even more intoxicating than what the government's gonna, going to allow, does the fact that the government has this good housekeeping seal of approval on it make it a little more benign? No. It I does. don't think that making something that isn't safe look safe is... But I'm also curious, just for the sake of argument, why doesn't the government get into porn distribution? You could certainly argue that it's less harmful. Uh, well, but, they, I mean, no, so far, people they, don't they, think that's a very good idea. They do tax it. They do derive revenues from it, don't Right, they? but they don't run it. They don't run it. Okay. Right, but they could protect the women better than the private corporations would. Hmm. And, you know, there's... Like, it's no more or less addictive than gambling. It's a lot less expensive. So, like, why stop with gambling? Let me try this with Jim, because you, you and I both know that the, the Liberals in Ontario are rolling out this Dalt McGuinty as Premier Dad thing. Um, how, how is this consistent with Premier Dad? Well, he's had a bit of identity crisis in the last few months. He's sort of all over the map. You know, one minute he's uh, tying everybody's shoelaces, the next minute he's allowing a great behemoths and mixed martial arts to beat the living. Uh, daylights out of each other. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what message. They're, they're very inconsistent on this, at, at, at least. Uh, yeah, the, the issue of it that often strikes me as the most odious is the advertising. You know, the cloying, appalling advertising that they virtually manipulate, wringing money out of people. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that's happening in Queen's Park, sort of flying under the radar that may bear on this, is uh, uh, a working group on... Uh, uh, financial literacy in schools. It's chaired by uh, Leanna Pendergast, the Liberal MPP from Kitchener Conestoga. And uh, they're looking at teaching some basic understanding to kids grade 4 through 12. And it wouldn't do uh, our students any harm at all to learn of the appalling astronomic odds they're facing in this kind of stuff and to learn a little bit, little bit about how much it costs to build schools, roads, and hospitals, and, why, and why upfront taxation is, is a reasonable thing. Some good numeracy education going on there. Yeah. Jordan? He, here's a visual for the odds. Imagine you have a 1 in 36 million chance of winning the lottery. Okay, imagine a field 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet. Now imagine you're, you're going to bet $10 that you can predict which 4-inch square a golf ball is going to land on if it's dropped. That's your odds of winning the lottery. Don't people know that? No, they can't. You can't know that. Like, it's not easy to know that. And it's for the reason I described earlier, mm -hmm. is that big numbers aren't real. And, and it, it's because, like, most of the numbers we use are, like, between 1 in 100 or right. maybe 1 in 1,000. They know the odds are lousy, but they also know for 2 bucks they can just sort of dream mm, for but 10 the minutes. Brain, yeah, yeah, but that's the issue. That's exactly the issue, is that for your buck, you get a dopamine kick. That's exactly what you're buying. And you might argue that it's worth a buck because you get the dopamine kick, but it's a drug. And the problem with the reinforcement is that it doesn't indicate an actual reward. So it's actually, the gamblers, the gambling industry actually capitalizes on a shortcoming of the human nervous system. And the government's promoting that. And the worst thing about it, I really believe the worst thing about it is that it preys on those who can control themselves the least for valid reasons. Like, here's an example. If you have Parkinson's disease and you take L-DOPA, there's a pretty good, decent chance you'll become a compulsive gambler. Like, that's not good, you know, and it's not really your fault. It's that the medication alters your reward sensitivity, and that'll send you into a spiral. We have heard lotteries called a voluntary tax, or even more pejoratively, a tax on the stupid. We've heard that used before. I want to read something that was in the Globe and Mail um, a week or so ago. We're calling this a voluntary tax, a little more benign. It seems like a surefire bet for a government struggling with a flood of post-recession red ink, the easy money of an online casino, tens of millions around the clock from eager gamblers. No controversial taxes or spending cuts, just low overhead and a stream of cash 24-7. That lure has proved irresistible to British Columbia, the first but far from the last Canadian province to jump into the business of online casinos. In just 12 years, online gambling has exploded into a $20 billion industry. All governments need to do is lure those gamblers with promises of a safer alternative that keeps money 
in the province. Finn, do you think that's actually a, a pretty good selling proposal for these guys? It keeps the money here, it'll ad address our deficit, and it's, I know there's no agreement around the table for this, but, and it's a relatively painless way of doing so. Well, it's, uh, it's absolutely a legitimate argument, and it's, it's an area in which I'm much more comfortable uh, discussing things because that makes it a fiscal policy or public policy question. Mm -hmm. I still disagree with it, though, uh, because uh, of the message about focus. I mean, we, we have, this is time where governments should be focusing on uh, spending management. I mean, any, uh, any, any, any proper fiscal management program would be centered on uh, control, controlling the spend rather than the continuous search for new revenue. Uh, and this, is, this particular form of new revenue is one that uh, many, you know, many of us do find distasteful, but it's, it's only, that's, that's, uh, that's only part of it. It's, it's simply wrong as a matter of, uh, of direction. Okay, Peter, as a matter of public policy, if, let's say, this new kind of revenue will bring in 100 million bucks a year, and you need the money, You've decided you need that money in order to pay for the programs, to lower the deficit, or so on. Would you rather raise taxes that amount to achieve that same amount of revenue? You see, a voluntary tax, a tax on the stupid, also a tax on the poor, a tax on the desperate. I quite, frankly, the I quite frankly could care less if some, uh, some multi-millionaire whale walks into a casino and drops a million bucks. I could care less. What I care about are the folks who have just lost their jobs okay, in community. I'm not hearing an answer, though. The, I'm what, you're going to get there, right? I, I'm saying a tax okay. on the poor. What I care about is folks like where I come from who have just lost their jobs because factories shut down, who find the casino a lure because it's a desperate attempt to get something back what they feel is taken away from. I find it insulting and, and offensive that the government is engaging now in poker lotto, which is a seven-day-a-week proposition. Not on Saturday night for your lotto 649, but seven okay, days so a week. Peter, if you're and, finance and, minister, you'd raise taxes $100 million to make that money instead. Yes on a progressive tax system so that people can afford to pay it, pay it as okay. they should be paid. Well, that's it. an answer. There. Now, so what's could, interesting can, is you can any government get re-elected saying we're going to raise your taxes by 100 million bucks to do this? Well, that's a good question, too. But it's interesting, we put the same qu question to Tim Hudak uh, last week, and he wouldn't bite on any uh, ways to reduce um, government reliance on gambling revenues. You know, I think they bank on the fact it's... Uh, it's here and it's probably here to stay. In fact, Dalton the McGinty, the Premier, has said virtually those things. At least they have the good grace to be sheepish about it, you know, and be a little embarrassed. And Dalton said something, there is no doubt about it. We have come to rely on gambling revenues. Perhaps in a better world, we wouldn't. <laughs> That's Parson McGinty. But the fact of the matter is, it's here, it's here to stay. Uh, what I think jar is jarring is uh, how that sort of pragmatism uh, jars with the sanctimony of the words they rail against gambling when they're in opposition beforehand. And Dalton's words, uh, you know, he, he railed against particularly online gambling. And for the very reason that it's simply not possible to provide the kind of policing and demanded that the Tory premier of the day, will you take the necessary steps to prohibit that kind of service from being offered in Ontario? You know, so that's a long way from it's here to stay. And, and I think that's what's confusing and vexing to a lot of people. Jordan. If it's $100 million a year, it's 14 bucks a piece. So, you know, who cares about the tax raise that that would constitute? So it's those same low-income people that you all no, purport to be concerned about. it's only 14 bucks, you know. Well, that's and real money to somebody who's on a fixed income. Well, they're going to end up paying it anyways, you know, through the gambling, and it has all sorts of other negative consequences. So, and, you know, I also wonder, like, we hear these accounting ideas. It's going to raise a hundred million dollars. Well, who says it is? Like, well, well, I plucked that who, out of the air. I yeah, don't know. Well, okay, f fair enough. But my suspicions are that if you calculate the benefit versus the gain, but you take everyone into account instead of just the government this year, that there's no gain in it at all. How can there be? Like, it's not a productive activity. Okay, you guys aren't going to like this one. Michael, can I see that last tweet that came up there? We were in the middle of Jim's answer, and there was a tweet that came up here that it was a little, I think it was aimed at some of the guys at who are on this program tonight. The world would be a better place with fewer moral busybodies around. Anybody want to take that one on? Sure, I'll Is take that on. Peter, go you ahead. Know, look, you mentioned internet porn. I mean, uh, look, we, we do concern ourselves with the welfare of children. We concern ourselves with, with the welfare of vulnerable people. We concern ourselves with, with people who are sick and, and, and who suffer illness. Uh, th those are moral positions as well as pragmatic positions. So I make no, apologize, uh, no apologies for, for being concerned about these things. Look, the, the government has reduced from $40 million a year to $28 million a year the support it provides for anti-gambling programs. They've reduced the amount of support. 
and there's a serious shortage of anti-gambling programs. This is part of the incredible hypocrisy of the government's role in this. They argue that some of the revenues will go to, to, to support these anti-gambling programs, and in fact, they've reduced the amount. Okay. We were funded by the Ontario Gambling Commission last year to, to, to run a study on gamblers, and we couldn't get permission from the bloody <laughs> casinos to let us on the buses yeah. to interview the people Who's who the are we? going to the gambling. Who's the One we? of my graduate students and oh, I. I yeah, so, you know, this is a good example of exactly that kind of hypocrisy. Oh, I'm sorry, well, I was going to say, I'm mean, against uh, piling on, but one could fully agree with the statement that there are too many busybodies in the world and still think the government shouldn't be uh, in the business. So uh, <laughs> you, you can take that one a couple of ways. It's, it's Absolutely. a wonderful question, yeah, so. and it probably uh, speaks for a huge mass of people out there. I think that's the trend, the way people are going. You know, they're saying things like, well, you're not looking after my pension anymore. Uh, you know, uh, you're asking me to pay user fees uh, here, there, and everywhere. Don't tell me what I can and can't do in, in, with my spare time. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are, have grown up in a culture where they they don't defer, they don't have that sort of religious impact of sin, that notion of sin and vice in their life, and they want to have fun. Okay, well, let's. Do I don't think anybody was suggesting that people shouldn't be allowed to gamble. We what the argument so far has been fundamentally that it isn't appropriate for the government to be particularly to be promoting it. And that's a completely it. different argument. It is not, it's not moral busybodiness at all. And, it's and a the, specific And the argument. rationale for, for the government, the state being in, involved in, 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 in being the sponsor of gambling, is the same rationale as for liquor stores being publicly owned, because then the, the state has some control over the, of the type of supply and yes. who it's supplied to. And, and so, the, so the reason for the government to be involved in gaming should be that so that it can show restraint and not engage not get involved in internet gambling and not promote seven day a week poker lottos. And that, that's, that's why the state should be there. If it were a free enterprise, then you let, let her rip. It's not quite a perfect analogy because they've got a virtual monopoly on the sale of alcohol and spirits, which they certainly wouldn't have in the poker areas, well, right? But they've got, a, they've got a monopoly when it comes to casinos, short, short of the occasional uh, basement game on a Saturday night. <laughs> In Welland, Ontario. In Welland, at, Ontario. At whose place? From time to time. Nick Pankoff, he's dead now, but a good man. A good man. All right. Let's just, we got a couple of minutes left, and I am curious as to hear what's, um, uh, what's being said online right now on our website or on our Facebook page. So, uh, control room. Can we go back to Mike Minot? There he is. Hello. Okay, Mike, come on in here and give us one last hit, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. We had a guy on the chat named Mike Marchand, and he said, as far as he's concerned, uh, it's a theft of family money. It's the very opposite of what the government should be doing for its citizens, and there's just no way for him that the government uh, should be doing it. There's a lot of other people who are discussing how the you know trustworthy brand of a government would make it the perfect online gambling source. You just you trust that they're not going to rip you off. Uh, so, I mean, really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. Uh, if if you if there's marketing spinners watching, uh, <laughs> this seems to appeal to some people online. Uh, we've had people online who. Uh, uh, have actually had uh, gambling product uh, problems. There's one guy named James who says that he's addicted to gambling. He can't stay away from the horse track, uh, and that nothing that he has uh, been able to do has uh, kept him away. He's tried to get himself blocked. He's tried to go into counseling, and so it's an interesting perspective you see here on on some of the uh, addiction issues that have been raised. Other people are just concerned that uh, if you got rid of the money that was coming in, like Yemi Thomas tweeted in saying he thinks that we'd have to cut social services and he doesn't want to start gambling with our income to, uh, to see if getting rid of gambling works out. Okay. Mike, thanks so much for moderating tonight, and I know you're going to keep standing by and keep an eye on what's happening at tvo.org slash the agenda. Thanks so much. Thank you. And uh, I have time left enough to thank all of you for coming in tonight and participating in our debate as well. Peter Cormos, the MPP for the Democrats from Welland. Finn Pleasure. Poshman from the C.D. Howe Institute. See you, see you. Jim Coyle, the Toronto Star on the other side of the table, along with Jordan Peterson from the University of Toronto. And there they are. Thanks, everybody, very yeah. much. Yep.